The Coalition of Natives and Allies would like to thank Beth Lawrence, Greer Luce, and the New Jersey Historical Commission for this important opportunity. I'd like to share with you our plan for this time together. Four members of CNA are going to do to present a 40 minute PowerPoint followed by a 13 minute TED talk and a two minute video. There will be a 20 minute time period for your reactions and questions. We acknowledge that the land we exist on is the tribal territory of the Lenape and is known as Lenape Hoking. Uh, this area is also the homeland of the Erie, Haudenosaunee, Muncie, Shawnee, and Susquehanna. Nearly all, including the Lenape, were disposed, displaced, or killed by the 1700s. Because of this forced removal, today there are no state or federally recognized tribes in Pennsylvania. In New Jersey today, there are three state recognized tribes, Nanticoke Lenny Lenape, Powhatan Lenape, Ramapo Munsee Lenape Nation. There are also three federally recognized Lenape tribes that were forcibly relocated to Oklahoma and Wisconsin and two Lenape nations in Ontario, Canada. They mostly use the term Delaware. We'd like to briefly introduce ourselves. There's more information about us on our website, coalitionofnativesandallies.org. Polito. I am Donna Fan Boyle. I'm Choctaw and Cherokee, mother of two sons and a co-founder of CNA, a member of the American Indian Movement of Central Texas, co-director of American Indian Movement Woodlands Territory Support Group. I'm also a board member of Middletown Township Human Relations Commission, and I live in Pennsylvania. One of our co-founders, Ramona, cannot be with us today. I'd like to introduce her. She is Ramona Yurun Yaha Woods. She's Mohawk, a co-founder of CNA, the mother of two sons, and lives in Reading, Pennsylvania. She's the founder of Little Blue Sky Foundation in support of Native communities, as well as a member of the American Indian Movement Central Texas chapter. My name is Kelly Bashu. I'm Dakota Sioux, raised in Glenside, Pennsylvania, but now reside in Meadowbrook, Pennsylvania. I'm the mother of two daughters and two sons, and there is much more to my life story, which I will share with you later in the program. Good morning. My name is Lynn Azarki. I'm an ally and a co-founder of CNA, mother of a son and a daughter, and executive director of the Kids Bridge Tolerance Center in New Jersey. For 40 years, we have created programs that deal with bullying prevention, anti-bias, empathy, respect, and accurate Native American history. I live in New Jersey. Hi, my name is Arla Patch, and I'm also a co-founder of CNA, an ally who had the great honor to serve as community engagement coordinator for the first Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the United States for what happened to Native children in the child welfare system while I lived in Maine. I'm a mother of a son and a grandmother of his son, and I now live in Quakertown, Pennsylvania. In order to understand the issue of using Native American mascots for sports teams, it is essential to understand the historical context for taking those images. Most of us were never taught the true history, especially if you are not Native. Generations of school students have been armed with harmful misinformation and false narratives which have laid the foundation for stereotyping and injustices. There is an abundance of research and studies that, you, that have shown the depth of harm this has caused for Native peoples. It's time for the truth to be taught so we can put an end to the widespread collective ignorance. We have a sheet of historical facts we, can, we cover in this program that can be downloaded after the presentation in the chat sidebar. So please don't feel you need to take notes. This presentation is packed with, in, with information and we understand that it can feel overwhelming. Also in the chat bar will be six steps can, schools can take to actually honor Native Americans instead of using Native names and images as mascots. Please share these widely. As you can see from this map, original tribal communities did not conform to the rigid boundaries of the European settlers have created. The proliferation of the originals peoples of what we call Turtle Island was complex and widespread. This map represents the reservation lands today. In four centuries, there has been a 95% population decrease. 
Right from the very start, Native people were considered savages and not the same as the European settlers. This quote, merciless Indian savages, is in the Declaration of Independence and also included in this document, the quote, all men are created equal, which we now understand really refers to white land-owning men. So 40 years before Columbus even sailed, Pope Nicholas V put out proclamations known as the Doctrines of Christian Discovery. And they basically stated that if you arrive in a foreign land and the inhabitants are not Christians, then they're enemies of Christ. And you can, quoting from the, directly from the document, capture, vanquish, and subdue the Saracens and pagans and other enemies of Christ, put them into perpetual slavery, take all their possessions and property. So you might think that this was only valid back in the um, 1500, back in the 15th century, but in 2005, it was used in the Supreme Court ruling against the Oneida Nation, and the Doctrine of Discovery was cited as a, in a footnote of the ruling, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg did deliver that opinion of the court. Speaking of Christopher Columbus, who never landed in North America, something else we were not taught is the genocidal and barbaric way he dealt with indigenous peoples in the islands where he landed. Some of his acts were to burn native people alive, rape children, cut off limbs, and use torture. These atrocities were documented in the diaries of a Spanish priest, Bartholomé de las Casas, who witnessed these acts. From the beginning, our country has had deliberate policies for the destruction of indigenous populations. A painful example is the 1755 bounty on the heads of Penobscot Indians of Maine, known as the Spencer Phipps Proclamation. The payoff was 50 pounds for an adult male, one year salary for clergy at the time. In the proclamation, you can see there is an amount for women and even children under the age of 12. There were bounties all over the United States. Please check our information sheet for details on the bounties in your area. Bounties were highly profitable and provoked widespread murder of indigenous peoples all over our continent. In the 1850s, the California native population was reduced by two thirds in one decade through bounty killing. In order to provide the more valuable male scalp, they were required to present genitalia with the scalp. Scalps were called redskins. Do all sports fans know this barbaric fact for the meaning of the word redskins? Native peoples are the most heavily legislated against in the history of our country. Every single treaty made with Native Americans has been broken. We want to mention just four of many laws that have impacted Native people's unalienable rights. Please refer to the information sheet for more details. The Civilization Fund Act of 1819. In 1830, the Indian Removal Act, widely known as the Trail of Tears. There were multiple trails of tears that negatively impacted nearly all tribes east of the Mississippi. Smallpox infected blankets were widely distributed as an extermination tactic and deliberate biological warfare used against natives. This letter from Colonel Bouquet to General Amherst details the distribution of such blankets and clothing to quote, inoculate the Indians. Lord Jeffrey Amherst approved and said quote, to try every other method that can serve to extirpate, meaning destroy or complete, destroy completely, the execrable race, execrable meaning extremely bad or unpleasant. The Dawes Act of 1887 that took 93 million acres of native out of native control, President Theodore Roosevelt said, the Dawes Act is the mighty pulverizing engine to destroy the tribal mass. Native people were assaulted from every angle and the one thing that would be a lifeline was our spiritual practices were outlawed in 1882. Although this country was founded on religious freedom, it is evident that the persecuted now became the persecutors. Not until 1978, after 96 years, 
This order was finally lifted with the American Indian Religious Freedom Act due to the efforts of the American Indian movement. Another damaging and disempowering policy, one of the truths that brought such shock and grief for me is voting. Another area of astounding historical fact. Did you know that native people were not given the right to vote until 1954? I was already born and not in every state until 1962. And this is particularly outrageous when you consider that native people serve in disproportionately high numbers in every military conflict since the beginning of this country even helping win World War I and World War II with code talkers. They died serving a country that denied them the right to vote. 1948, the United Nations defined genocide, quote, an act or acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Let's highlight two sections in the 1948 document of the articles on the screen. Let's take the first one, Article 2, Section A, killing members of the group. Here's a small sample of Native American massacres. Clear Lake Massacre in 1850, 200 killed. Sand Creek Massacre, 1863, 230 killed. Wounded Knee Massacre, 1890, 300 killed. Bear River Massacre, 1863, 400 killed. There are many, many others. Let's look at Article 2, Section 3, quote, the forcible transfer of children from one group to another group. This is what the Maine Truth Commission and residential schools is about. We must recognize that our government has engaged in all of these. Great harm has resulted from remaining ignorant of and silent about these painful facts of our shared history with Native peoples. Take a breath, take some time for this to sink in. We know this is a lot to absorb. In the 1940s, the US government talked about Indian policy for liquidation of Native peoples. Given that the Holocaust liquidated 11,000 in World War II, they changed the language to termination policies. In 1956, the government passed the Indian Relocation Act as one of these policies. This act moved 30,000 Indians into cities. It was another attempt to, quote, solve what the government saw as, quote, their Indian problem. Natives were manipulated with unkept, unkept promises of vocational training, education, and housing. Indians had difficult assimilating into white mainstream society, resulting in an increase in poverty, alcoholism, and a loss of culture and traditions. The lasting and damaging effects of this is that the Native Americans have the highest unemployment rates and the highest poverty rates in the United States. Would it surprise you that 71% of all Native Americans now live in urban areas? AIM, the American Indian Movement. In July of 1968 in Minneapolis, the American Indian Movement was founded as an advocacy group in the, to address the problem of police brutality and generations of inequity. In 1978, AIM organized a 3,000 mile march from San Francisco to Washington, DC to present the 20 point proposal of the Trail of Broken Treaties to President Nixon and he would not meet with them. Although as a result, Congress did pass the previously mentioned American Indian Religious Freedom Act and the Indian Child Welfare Act, ICWA, which tries to protect the tribe, which tries to protect tribes to keep their children. In order to fully grasp the significance of, the ne of this next piece of history, I ask you to imagine the government taking away your children, your grandchildren under the threat of imprisonment and or the elimination of subsidies. This practice of taking Native children away from their families has continued for Native children through adoption and foster care with ICWA as the only law to protect them. To trace the historical thread for why we need a truth and reconciliation to address this in every state with tribal nations, we need to go back to the 1800s. By the way, our Interior Department Secretary Deb Halland has just created a commission to investigate the US boarding school error. Colonel Richard Pratt, Colonel Richard Henry Pratt led the shift in official policy from violence and conquest to the policy of genocidal assimilation of native children into the white culture. 
The flagship school of force to simulation created by Pratt was the Carlisle Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Their motto was kill the Indian in him and save the man. Policies of assimilation are policies of cultural genocide and a deliberate systematic destruction of a culture. Carlisle was the model for over 450 Indian residential schools all over the United States and all over Canada. Hundreds of thousands of students passed through their doors. Children were taken as young as four and were required to stay until the age of 16 to 18 to ensure that they gave up, quote, their savage beliefs. Many never went home in the summer, but were sent out as free labor to work on farms. Many died at the school and were not returned to the correct tribe, or those that did no longer spoke the language and remembered little of their tribe's culture. They lost connection to their families and their parents. Overall, 150,000 children in Canada and hundreds of thousands of Native children in the United States were removed from their homes. Arriving at the Indian residential schools, they took away their clothing and sacred traditional possessions. They cut off all their hair, they doused them with DDT powder, which is a carcinogenic pesticide, and they were forbidden to speak their language or they would have their mouths washed out with lye. They were forbidden to keep, communicate with their siblings. They were intentionally kept apart. Children were also abused physically, spiritually, emotionally, and sexually. Over a thousand children died at the Carlisle School alone. Residential schools reached their peak in the 1970s in the US and in the last residential school in Canada closed in 1996. Native children died at alarming rates at these schools through neglect, disease, inadequate food, and certainly unsatisfactory medical care. Unmarked and masked graves at the sites of these schools are just starting to be discovered with ground penetrating radar. Here you can see graves marked at a school in Canada. Donna. Sorry, I was muted. With the loss of homelands, the way of life, their means of survival, their autonomy, and the massacres of Indian people, the assault to every aspect of our existence has created a wound to the mind, body, and the spirit. This intergenerational wound passed from one generation to another, experienced a devastating blow when they took our children. Historical intergenerational trauma is compounded when society pretends this history never happened. Because Ramona cannot be with us here today, I am going to read her words. She said, quote, one of the children taken was Michael Guy Hanade by the Brook Day, my grandfather. He was born in Kahnawake, Quebec in 1896. I was in college when I took this photograph of him before he took his final journey in 1990 at the age of 95. When I look at the faces of these children in this photograph, I notice their expressions. There is no semblance of childhood joy. I see fear and sadness. As a woman who has raised two men, this photo breaks my heart. The smallest boy in the front and center of this photograph is my grandfather at an unknown age and date. He appears to be between six and eight years old, placing the photo around 1902 to 1904. The photograph was taken at the St. Peter Claver School for Boys, a Spanish Indian residential school operated by the Jesuits. In the early 1900s, it was known as Wiflamakan Boys Institute Industrial School of Manitoulin Island, Ontario. Opening in 1838, its mission was to assimilate First Nations children from the ages of four to 16. Ramona continues, many of my elders had spoken of the malnutrition and the physical and sexual abuse that took place there. Although my grandfather never spoke of what was done to him in the years he lived there, I do know that he was abused during that time. He told us that it was so bad that he and a few other boys risked everything to try and run away back to their families. They hopped a train headed east back towards Kahnawake. They were caught. He said they were physically punished so severely to assure that they wouldn't run away again. Quote, at the time that Michael Day was released and returned back to Kahnawake, 
He had no family left to care for him. Both his parents had died during that time he had been taken. He and his parents were robbed of ever having the opportunity for a relationship. For a time, he roamed the streets of Kahnawake as a homeless orphan. He eventually was taken in by the kindness of the Phillips family who raised him and cared for him. In spite of all this, he made a life for himself. I ask each of you to search your heart and consider how it might feel to know the child in this photograph with all he had gone through was your beloved grandfather." Unquote. The Dakota 38 plus two was the largest mass execution in our country's history and it was ordered by President Abraham Lincoln. Although a military tribunal had sentenced 303 Dakota men to death, Lincoln commuted it down to 38 plus two who were hanged the next day. The evidence against the Dakota was spare, the tribunal was biased, and the defendants were unrepresented, many not even speaking English. In that UN definition, Article 2, Section D, quote, the imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, as many as 70,000 Native women were sterilized by coercion and without their consent during the 60s, 70s, and 80s at the hand of the U.S. government. It was called the Family Planning Services and Population Research Act of 1970, and that created the premise. Sometimes women were told that their benefits would stop if they did not consent, or that the process could be reversed, or they were even given papers to sign while they were under sedation. And when investigated, what the government said was, we did it, quote, to alleviate poverty. As mentioned earlier, as a result of the longest walk by AIM, Congress enacted the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978, known as ICWA. This act codified higher standards of protection for Indian children. ICWA recognized that in native culture, a child has three parents, the mother, the father, and the tribe. It is in the best interest of native children to be placed in native homes. And three, ICWA said, it is in the best interest of a tribe for children to stay in their own community. In the 1950s, 35% of Native children were still taken from the tribes nationwide. Between 1958 and 1967, the taking of Native children expanded into adoption, like the Indian Adoption Program. To try to prove that Native children were better off with white families. In Canada, it was known as the quote, 60s scoop. Thousands of Indigenous children were taken from their families, adopted by white families in Canada and the United States, losing their names, their language, and the connection to their heritage. I was one of those babies in who in 1963, at the age of three months, was adopted by a white couple. My new parents signed papers committing to raise me in the Catholic religion. My adoptive, my adoptive parents thought they couldn't conceive a child, but my adoptive parents who went on to have five biological children who grew up with me as my sisters and brothers. At the age of 50, I started to search for my birth family. I am happy to say that I found them, living in Sisseton, Wapiton, Oyate, Lake Traverse Reservation in South Dakota. I am the eighth of nine siblings and the only one who had been adopted out. My whole life, though I knew I was loved, I never felt like I quite belonged. And I know it may be a difficult concept to understand, but when I found and met my birth family, everything fell into place. On the very first meeting day of meeting my mom, we went to a very sacred ceremony called Sundance. As I watched my sister dance, I knew that this is where I belonged, and I am proud and honored to say that I am now a Sundancer. This is the year that I brought all four of my children to finally meet their grandmother, the Kushi. Mom is now 96 years old, and we're all members of a proud Dakota Sioux family. In Maine, in 1984, the rate of taking Native children was 19 times higher than other states, and children were being taken without notification to the tribe as required by the ICWA law. It was these rates of taking Native children and the lack of compliance with ICWA that led to the first Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Maine, the first one in the country. There are the tribal chiefs and the governor of Maine at the signing ceremony. The Truth Commission in both Canada and Maine have been a good start to acknowledging the atrocities 
an attempt to begin a healing process. ICWA only applies to citizens of federally recognized tribes in New Jersey because it is not a federally recognized tribe. Nanticoke Letting Lenape Chief Mark Gould often has to deal with disrespect from judges who show little concern or courtesy because they are not bound by ICWA for state tribes. In New Jersey, Native people experience racism and denial of their existence on many levels, including the public schools. This is Chief Perry of the Ramapo Munsee Lenape in Northern New Jersey. Oftentimes a native person is dismissed if they don't fit the archaic stereotype, typical vision of an Indian based on their inaccurate history that is taught in schools and learned from television and movies. The tribal leader of the Powhatan Renape Nation who recently passed away was Reverend Roy Running Stream Bundy. At one point, almost 90% of the population of Morrisville, New Jersey were Powhatan Renape people. The legacy of genocide has left Native communities with the highest rate of socioeconomic distress in the country. These statistics on chronic diseases, unemployment, suicide, homicide, police shootings, missing and murdered women, substance abuse, etc., do not reflect who we are or what has happened to us since the first contact and how the government has continued to fail us. Native Americans have the average life expectancy that is five years less than all other races in the United States population. And it can range to as much as 25 years less in some areas of the country. Land, water, hunting, and fishing rights continue to be a struggle for Native people in this country today. The Penobscot Reservation is made up of several islands in the Penobscot River and their reservation has always included the river, their source of food with fishing. Regardless, the state of Maine has been trying to take away the river as part of their reservation. In addition to the statistics mentioned, these are a few of the current issues faced by Indigenous people. Uranium mine poisoning, voter suppression, underfunded health care, non-potable water and lack of indoor plumbing or electricity, inadequate education system, poor housing, oil pipelines, murdered and missing Native women and girls, an illness from atomic bomb testing, loss of tribal lands, and broken treaties. So right from the very start, the doctrine of discovery origins, the, to all the way to manifest destiny, which I remember being taught in school, we saw nature and her resources as a commodity. This is truly the conqueror mentality. And I'm going to be referring to we as we Euro-Americans settlers. We took what we wanted and did anything it took to get the original people out of the way. And what's so interesting about this painting is notice the angelic nature of this taking. Um, Manifest destiny was our actual God-given right to take over the country. So the truth is that we, white people, took their land, culture, and languages. We took their resources. We killed their people who were in our way. And then we took their children. And the latest version of that mentality is that we take their identity and individual tribal cultures and replace them with stereotyped caricatures and racial slurs. And then we tell them it is to honor them. We take away their identity with mascots, using it for our own entertainment. And we have the arrogance to tell them what it means. As a white woman of European settler descent, this history brings up intense emotions for me guilt, sadness, shock, a lot of shame, and deep grief. And sometimes I just am so angry that I was never taught these things. And what I found is that I can use those emotions as fuel to create change in my own behavior, to share these truths with others, and under Native leadership, take action. Lynn, you need to unmute. Thank you, sorry. When you reduce a people to a mascot, a sports mascot, you take away their equality. They are not the same as other people and do not require the same respect. This profoundly affects policy which impacts native communities today. With many mascots being animals, you put them on the same level as an animal, not a human. 
Redskins, Braves, Raiders, Warriors, all are disrespectful and harmful to youth. Extensive peer-reviewed research has found that exposure to Native American sports mascots increases a student's negative stereotyping of other races, which leads to more discrimination. Is this what we want to teach our children? This is the very absurdity at the heart of this issue. Non-Native children taking Indian identity, while Native children had their identity beaten out of them. This history makes it unconscionable that non-Native students play Indian today. Normally, we would not use the racist slur redskins. Instead, we would say the R word. Webster's Dic Learner's Dictionary defines it as degrading derogatory term for Native peoples, which should be avoided. For the sake of content, context in this presentation, we'll be using the full word that for us evokes the equivalent of the N word. At the Neshaminy High School in Bucks County, the student body has been taught for generations that it is acceptable to make a mockery of and to bastardize our culture. This provokes disrespectful behavior and is one way in which systematic racism gets perpetuated by teaching our youth. A native headdress is earned by a tribal community member over a long period of time, made by other members of the community as a sacred honor. Each time the person did an act of bravery or service for the tribe, they earned a feather which was added. It is a great distinction to wear one and an honor that is earned. Instead, we have taught our children during early childhood education to trivialize native culture. As you see here, a student who thinks an honorary tribal custom is merely a costume. School boards create and revise discrimination and harassment policies to protect all minorities. Promotion of race-based native mascot three cute natives as the only minority not protected under school board policies. Why is that? Native Americans are the only minority where race-based discrimination is tolerated. There would never be another minority used in this dis dis degrading way. Nationwide acceptance of native mascot three trivial trivializes the verbal and physical assaults against those who stand against it. We are told that we must accept this false honor or get over it. Two Pennsylvania school districts still use the racist epithet Redskins, and three Pennsylvania districts have just voted to end the use of their Native American mascots, even with the issues of a pandemic affecting their districts. They were Radnor, Unionville, and Allentown. There are nearly 2,000 schools nationwide with Native mascots. Would anyone feel honored by this? The hypersexualization of Native women has encouraged the higher rates of violence and murder. The U.S. Department of Justice found that American Indian women face murder rates that are more than 10 times the national average. The CDC states that murder is the leading cause of death among Native American women. One in three Native women reports having been raped during her lifetime. Generations of indigenous activists, scholars, and community members have worked tirelessly to persuade the Washington Redskins professional football team to change the name and the imagery. Recently, the incredible momentum around the Black Lives Matter movement, along with threats of defunding by their sponsors, created that final push that we needed to fully convince, finally convince the team to change. The Chamonix, along with other schools, held Washington up as an excuse for hanging onto their own race-based native mascotry. But now this needs to be the start of a chain reaction among all the other professional college, high school, and elementary schools sports that, tell, that still use Indian mascots. Tax dollars should not be used to support educational institutions which promote discrimination and racism. Stereotypes, harassments, and bullying. When we know better, we should do better. It is widely recognized in society that blackface is unacceptable. However, there is a disparity and a disconnect for redface. This is the mascot Chief Illinois performing a mocking native dance. The University of Illinois ended this in 2007. Many schools created their native mascots around 90 to 100 years ago at a time when Native people were highly discriminated against in our country and had no voice. Many tried to hide that they were Native while schools were proud to misappropriate 
that identity and culture for their own entertainment. Donna, as you know, is a mother and a resident of Neshaminy School District. It has been a nine year ongoing battle to get the school board to understand how wrong it is to have a Native American mascot in an educational setting. She has experienced horrific social media attacks, cyberbullying, and actual threats of physical violence of, from some members of the community. Finally, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission had to take over the case. Donna presented educational materials, studies, and research 16 times to the Neshaminy School Board. However, they have spent nearly $500,000 of taxpayer money to keep this mascot. Donna has individually been working on this for nine years, but it's really important to know that Indian Country has been speaking up about this issue since the 1960s. In January of 2020, the Coalition of Natives and Allies, CNA, was created as a resource to educate communities and assist school districts in making a transition to non-race-based mascots and logos. Our educational programs are unique in that they represent both Native and non-Native voices in partnership. Several schools in Pennsylvania have reached out to us in recent months and are welcoming education and change. We supported Radnor, Unionville, and Allentown to change their mascots. We are also working with the PA legislature to introduce legislation to end Native Amer American mascots in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and support teaching accurate Native American history. Not only is our website a source of information, but also where you can join our mailing list. If you're interested in this issue, please join the mailing list and stay informed of our progress. Here you see Molly and Dana, who is now the Penobscot ambassador in front of the school board in Maine's Cohegan School District. Hers is a powerful story of a successful fight to end native sports mascots in Maine. Please see her compelling TED talk on our website. The levels of foster care and adoption of native children are still very high today. In South Dakota, the native population is 13.5% but Native children are in foster care at the rate of 54%. The story of Native American history you just heard is not well known. That is why so many people don't understand how a Native American mascot is so hurtful. By witnessing the murder of George Floyd, America is awakening to the injustices that have been present all along. We empower all of you to be both allies and teachers, sharing what you have learned today. The time has come to be in compliance with the values of our country inspires to stand for. Healing and building community requires we have a common understanding and of our shared history. The non-Native population has benefited and continues to benefit from the fact that Native people are were targeted for destruction. Sharing this truth is the work for healing of our country. This is the 50 foot statue entitled Dignity in South Dakota. In spite of all this history we've shared with you, please know the resilience of indigenous peoples of this land is strong. Among native peoples, there is a, mo a movement of reclaiming our languages, ceremonies, and traditions, food sovereignty, identity, and healing from residential schools. Working together, we can work toward healing this history that we've both inherited, and in partnership, write a different ending. From the inaugural poet, Amanda Borman, America is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. And I just want to mention that we are going to go ahead and share the uh, good talk that we mentioned. Uh, this will be 13 minutes. Happy belated Indigenous Peoples Day. As a child, I was anxious. You could tell just by looking at me. I had long, unruly hair that frizzed up around my face. My eyes were a deep shade of brown. And I often worried so much and slept so erratically that I formed dark circles under those eyes. It was kind of a mess. <laughs> I worried a lot. 
I worried about big things like the wind and the rain knocking our house over, or my dad not making it home safe from work. I worried about little things like squabbles with my siblings or having to constantly pronounce my unusual name for my teachers at school. What we now call anxiety, my parents affectionately, but maybe a bit exhaustedly, refer to as my fears. I've moved through life now with this anxiety, and I've learned to use it to give me a bit of an edge. I have something in me that sends me very strong signals when things feel wrong, and I get very motivated and driven to fix them until they feel right. Although I struggled with my fears, I was not an unhappy or miserable child. I loved long walks in the woods with my dad, learning about birds and animals and throwing rocks into the stream. I loved my mother's delicious cooking and how her hands felt cool on my forehead when I had a fever. I loved my younger siblings most of the time. And I loved my Penobscot culture. The songs, dances, language, stories were all a constant source of comfort and relief. They grounded me in the world. I learned about the mighty hero Gluskabe in our legends and how he was once a young boy, learning lessons and making mistakes. The little girl in me still finds solace in this ancient wisdom. I can vividly remember the first time I felt self-conscious about who I am. It was a heavy blow dealt to me by a popular children's movie, Peter Pan, by Walt Disney. We are probably all familiar with this story. Peter is the eternally young boy who travels from Never Never Land to take children from their home to go have adventures. One of these adventures takes them to an Indian encampment. Now, why would we place Indians in Never Never Land where make-believe things live, like mermaids, pirates, and fairies? Now, when I first saw these Indians on screen, I thought, wow, these people are like me. However, any sense of possible pride or representation quickly faded away when I saw how we were portrayed. They look silly. They look stupid. The Indians had red-skinned faces. They spoke in broken English. They used the triggering and violent racial slur, squaw, to refer to the women. It's hard for me to say. The women were either trollish and mean or sexy and silent. When they sang a song called, What Makes the Red Man Red? I was filled with so much confusion and shame that I sank back in my seat and I felt that maybe I didn't even understand who I was. I was six years old. Little did I know all of this internal conflict and unease would manifest itself decades later in being able to create positive social change for my people and even help write state laws. I move through life and I hold my culture close. I learned about the beauty and the pain of being indigenous. 500 years of the intergenerational trauma, the rippling effects of colonization, attempted genocide, it can be really overwhelming. However, it is balanced with the fact that we are still here. Indigenous people have shown a fierce resilience, and we have held on to our culture and values with a grip that is thousands of years in the making. I am my ancestors' dream come true, simply by living and existing and knowing who I am. And I owe it to them to use my voice often and honorably and to break destructive cycles. So that's what I did. I became active in advocating for the removal of Indian mascots for sports teams when I was in high school. Yay. (laughs) 
I saw my peers in other schools dancing around in fake headdresses, fake war paint, basically wearing my existence as a costume. I got angry. It was a lot of the same feelings that were stirred up when I watched Peter Pan, but now I was ready to do something about it. These mascots are not just offensive, they are actually harmful. They are degrading, they are dehumanizing, they mock and marginalize important sacred parts of our culture. They are wrong. I made it my mission to fight back. When I was appointed as ambassador for the Penobscot Nation, I was able to use my years of activism experience in my new role, helping to shape and create public policy and law. This year, in 2019, Maine passed a law to ban the use of Native American mascots in its public schools and universities. We are the first state in the nation to accomplish this. It's awesome. <laughs> I will forever cherish the role that I played in making this happen, and I have the deepest gratitude for everyone who has fought this battle with us. As I stood in the State House with my daughters by my side as the governor signed this bill into law, I felt a sense of powerful peace. I wanted to reach back in time and hug that frizzy-haired, anxious little girl and tell her to keep fighting for what is right. She will face a lot of hard work, self-doubt. She will stand in front of rooms of people and tremble because they are so angry at her for speaking her truth. And she will speak it anyway. Thank you. Changing the world for the better has never come about easily shaking up power structures, and having to convince other people that you are just as human as they are is exhausting. But when I think about what my ancestors went through, when I think about the future I want for my children, and when I look deep within myself, what choice have I ever had but to keep fighting this fight? Social justice is a marathon, not a sprint. We plant seeds of change, and if we are lucky, we see them grow into lasting and meaningful cultural shifts. The Indian mascot fight in Maine has not always been a success story. A lot of us have faced a lot of ugliness and racism. I've been threatened with rape, with murder. I've been told that a lynch mob will come find me. I've been called a squaw. I've been nicknamed Princess Runs Her Mouth. All of this from people who think their Indian mascot honors me, right? I get angry hate mail to my email, voicemail, even delivered to my house. All of these things need to be handled with care, and I don't take it lightly, but they don't scare me. What truly scares me is when we lose our sense of shared humanity. When we see other human beings as enemies or obstacles, one-dimensional objects not worthy of respect or equality because they're different from us and we don't understand them. When we lose our ability to have compassion and love, that is when we will crumble as a society. The Indian mascot battle has always served as a study in psychology and empathy. If we tell you something hurts, you don't get to decide that it doesn't. Thank you. I have been called a lot of terrible things, some of which I won't share here. But I've also been called a powerhouse, a hurricane, a rock star, a change maker, and a truth teller. Now, I've learned to love this side of myself, and I appreciate her for her courage. But most days, I see myself as that nervous little girl, caring too much about too many things, working so hard 
to find those plateaus of peace and progress. Now that I am a mother, I get to soothe that part of myself by teaching my daughters to be empowered and to be confident, but to also share the burden and engage others to speak truth to power and elevate the voices of the oppressed. I've even learned to love my anxiety. It does give me an edge on my good days, and it teaches me how to cope on my not-so-good days. I have been hesitant to discuss it publicly, because let's face it, as a woman of color, I need to work extra hard to be taken seriously. So why would I put anything out there that may make me seem weak or crazy? However, it is such an important part of my journey and has really helped shape who I am. And it also serves as a reminder that we are all fighting battles that nobody knows about. All the more reason to remember that shared humanity. The ban on Indian mascots in Maine has made this state a safer and more inclusive place for my people. It's a huge accomplishment. We do have work left to do at the state and national level, but I think it's okay to stop in this moment and really smell these flowers. Indigenous people are still here. We are not a dyed-out race that lives in Never Never Land. We are not Halloween costumes, and we are not sports mascots. I celebrate that existence and that resilience every day, and I invite you all to celebrate with me. I also challenge you to think about what that means to you. How will you move about all your spaces and make them safer, more tolerant, more inclusive? We are in a time right now where our differences can really divide us and scare us. So how will all of us come together and work towards good? I am a multitude of things. I am a mother. I am a daughter. I am a sister. I am an ambassador. I am a Penobscot indigenous woman. And I am not a mascot. Kachi Waliwani, thank you. I forgot escape. Sorry, folks. Um, thank you so much for um, listening to that because uh, Molly and Dana actually has written a letter of support to our mascot effort here in Pennsylvania. Um, so we're very grateful to her and all the work that she has done. Um, we'd like to show you just a two minute uh, video, which many of you might have already seen, um, but it's well worth um, taking a look at. So just let me get the technology here. Share screen. When are you guys going? Proud. Forgotten. Indian. Not all. Blackfoot. Hey, Arla. Um, we cannot see your screen. Survivor, spiritualist, patriot. I'm sorry. Sitting bull. I'm sorry, did you say something? Yes, I'm sorry. I was just jumping in. We cannot see your screen. Oh, dear. Um, so okay. if you could just retry the screen share. Thank oh, you. Yes, thank you for interrupting because it was so loud. I barely heard that. Okay, share the screen. Oh yes, I have to go down to this one. Okay, sorry. <laughs> oh geez. Um, how is that? Can you see that? That looks great. There we go, starting off. Proud. Forgotten. Indian. Navajo. Blackfoot. Inuit and Sioux. Survivor, 
spiritualist, patriot, Sitting Bull, Hiawatha, and Jim Thorpe. Mother, father, son, daughter, chief. Apache, Pueblo, Choctaw, Chippewa, and Crow. Underserved, struggling, resilient. Squanto, Red Cloud, Tecumseh, and Crazy Horse. Rancher, teacher, doctor, soldier. Seminole, Seneca, Mohawk, and Creek. Mills, Will Rogers, Geronimo. Unyielding, strong, indomitable. Native Americans call themselves many things. The one thing they don't. So um, we are now going to open up to reactions and um, questions. And certainly reactions are very uh, healing and helpful. So feel free to- I grew up Jeez. in central Wisconsin, outside of a town called Mos- oh, Sorry, folks. Um, so, and Greer is going to facilitate that. Absolutely. Well, first of all, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for the incredible presentation and the, the video clips that you shared. Um, so powerful. Um, so just thank you, first of all. Um, I have a couple of questions here um, to get us started, but I just want to remind folks in attendance that you can add your questions um, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your, your screen, and we encourage you to do so. Um, so the first question that I had, um, you covered so much um, in the presentation that you shared at the start of the, the program. And knowing that we have um, quite a few educators um, in the audience today and at the conference, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience and kind of advice and guidance in terms of working with tribal communities, um, both locally, but um, in other parts of the country as well, when it comes to educating students in the classroom. <coughs> um, Donna, you should probably mute on, we're getting a lot of, um, a lot of sound. I don't know if she can hear us. Um, Lynn, you're muted. You want to kick us off working with the, the main Native Americans and the work you did? Yeah, so so the question I was I was looking at um, Donna and um, trying to figure out how we can include her. She has to be on the road and go somewhere. So she's going to join us from her car and her cell phone. Um, the question is, how do you work with local communities? Um, basically, Greer, um, first of all, it's it's hard to find local communities, especially in a state like uh, Pennsylvania, where there no, are no state recognized or federally recognized tribes. And what does complicate that is that there is a definition by ASET, the Association of Colonial Era Tribes, to indicate what does that really mean to be a state recognized tribe. And it means that you need to prove your ongoing historical community and continuous community since the colonial times. Now, unfortunately, there are people who do have native heritage, but they don't have that characteristic. So it can be very confusing when a historical club, a 5013C, for example, organizes, and there are some native people in there, they may have a certain amount of knowledge, they may have you know, not quite what a what an ongoing community would have had, but they then present themselves as the the teachers. 
So that is one caveat that I guess I just need to mention is that to really connect with tribal community is really important. Um, of, and what's fortunate about New Jersey and what helped Lynn and me when we got our grant from the um, New Jersey Council for the Humanities, we were able to partner with the tribes in New Jersey and get their um, perspective and their editing and their okay on everything that we did. Um, so reaching out to those communities is very helpful. Um, one of the things that I feel good about with CNA is that we do provide lots of uh, educational materials and a lot of the appropriate, they've been vetted, they've been, you know, through native uh, voices, and many of them are native sourced. So that's the one thing I guess I would say is just to watch out for is um, those folks who are presenting as a culture club, but they're not really truly a um, historic and I mean, I know I'm, I'm, I'm a white girl saying this, but this is what my experience has been, is that um, that authenticity is really crucial. And it can also be confusing, because as you saw in part of our presentation, not all Native people look like the movies that we grew up on. I hope that answers that question. Um, feel free to um, add more if, if need be. That's, that was a very great answer. Thank you. Um, so uh, kind of along those lines, and I, I know I'm jumping ahead to one of the resources, I think that that we're that you're planning to, to share um, that we'll share with the attendees via email after the session. But what are some active steps um, that um, particularly, you know, um, educators, but also all of us <laughs> um, can take to kind of move beyond lip service and to actually honor and center Native voices. Um, again, thinking about in the classroom, but also, you know, more broadly. Um, so yes, that, that is the, the next question. Join our mailing list. <laughs> uh, you know, I, mean, I mean, just on the surface, and um, I mean, maybe the others will have something to add to this also, but just on the surface, it's to work toward causes that are going to be giving justice to Indigenous communities. And the justice of, of not using Native people, continuing to use Native people for masketry is such a place where the rubber meets the road. It's such a basic underlying cause and, and symptom that if you can ally and join on that and help us, we have 66 schools, I think, still in Pennsylvania. How many in New Jersey, Lynn? Se 76 schools have native mascots, 76 schools in New Jersey. So we have a lot of work to do. And through um, the process of change, that's where we can educate people. And in fact, we empower every single person who listened to us today to download those sheets, or I think actually they're gonna be sent to you and and share what you learn. I mean, I know it's a lot of things, names and, you know, doctrine of Christian discovery and, you know, all of these things. But if you have that sheet and you can start to share it with other people, you can spread the truth. And that is yeah, I think um, as uh, director of Kidsbridge Tolerance Center, uh, the first thing you have to do is educate yourself. We were all shocked to, to learn how much that we didn't know it at our age. The Kids Bridge has modules for uh, kids of different ages. Um, Donna, can you mute? The car is noisy. Sure. And then, uh, and then we'll let you get back on. So modules um, of research. Um, we have done discuss Native American sports mascots with middle schoolers. And it's an interesting process. You don't want to tell kids to think. You don't want to tell students what to think but to let them talk to one another, to create empathy, to walk in the shoes of a Native American uh, for a racist sports mascot. And it's really interesting to watch them transition from holding uh, an appropriate mascot near and then having empathy to realize that it, it's not respectful. So again, uh, what Orla said to use the knowledge of our Native American chiefs and nations in New Jersey, and yet, as white people, we are the ones who really have to do the work. And Donna, I'm, I'm sorry that, that I'm probably gonna be noisy. I'm traveling right now. I have a, a native wedding to go to, um, but I still wanted to see if there was any questions that um, I can answer. 
and I can just say from a personal experience that, um, <clears throat> you know, it's the um, responsibility of, you know, administrators and school boards, but um, teachers and educators um, should use their voices to speak out and let these school boards and administrators know that um, you know the truth now, you know, and no matter how much they want to fight back and say that their mascots are for honor and that they don't want to hear the true history, um, the fact of the matter is they've been teaching false history for far too long. And that's why um, all students are heard by this and um, Native students and Native people in particular are um, very damaged um, by you know, decades of this behavior and it just can't go on any longer. It's, it's just not fair that natives are the only people who are used as mascots, the only race of people used as mascots and as representations for schools that, um, you know, many times are predominantly white or predominantly not native. Um, so um, we really need our allies to, um, you know, to, to teach and, and speak up for us and, um, you know, make us um, protected by those policies as well as all other minorities. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and along those lines, um, we held a program with the um, Historical Commission in September um, related to, to mascots and removing racist mascots in schools. And one of the things that came up quite a bit is practical steps for getting movements off the ground. Obviously, I think we would encourage everyone to, to get in touch with you to, to start that process. But um, you know, do you have any advice for students who are you know, starting grassroots movements or educators um, to kind of get that process started at their own institutions? Uh, there are student-led groups, um, you know, young people who lead groups that can help. I mean, we can, like, you can go onto our website and if somebody needs help, they can send us a message, but we can certainly put um, students in contact with other students who have been successful in, um, you know, in changing their mascots. And we have helped, you know, CNA has helped them, those students. Um, we've had conferences with them and done Zoom meetings to um, advise them. So there is help out there for any student who feels that they want to get on the bus and uh, make this change happen. We will support them. And through the student voices, one of the urgings is to educate the school board. Um, they are very undereducated. And even when CNA members went to the state capitol and we met representatives, uh, we were shocked that they had never even heard of the, of the uh, boarding schools. And, and the fact that the flagship school is right down the road in Carlisle was um, just kind of astounding. They didn't know what we were talking about when we said the boarding schools. So education, education, education. I mean, that's just so huge. And if a school board will be open to hearing a program and if their students organize and almost demand it and ask for educational programming, I mean, that's where an organization like ours can come in. And there may be others, cer certainly, um, that can educate this. Because I used to see that in Maine. My, my job was to talk to white audiences about why did we need a truth commission? And we used to call it the shock and awe talk because all these white people were shocked and in awe and some of them said that took days they went around like in a fog of guilt like oh my god I didn't know I didn't know and the problem is you don't want people just to step aside or back up if they feel guilty or sad they need to to go work through that and and then as I said in the talk use that as fuel to fuel action but the caveat, the key is that action has to be under native leadership because white people thinking on their own, how they're gonna fix this um, is not a good recipe. Yeah, and I, just, I, just want, I just wanted to say too that as um, an adoptee and being um, adopted when I was three months old and not finding my family till I was 50, I also grew up in that world of 
thinking, you know, Columbus discovered America and, you know, wearing pilgrim hats at Thanksgiving and doing all of that. And then now knowing the real truth, that's like my passion now is to teach that. And, and I did feel like she, like Arla just said, I felt a lot of grief about, I felt a lot of guilt because I was like, wait, I am Native American. I am Sue. Yet it was all taken away from me. And now I want to start teaching that, you know, how not to use us as a mascot, how to represent us in the, in the, in the correct way. Um, it's just, you know, just very important now that we know the truth. And I'm actually a, a nanny and um, I have a 10 year old boy who I've been with since he was five. And so along the way, I, um, you know, gently taught him some things. And now being in middle school and he's coming home and saying, when they were talking about um, indigenous people that somebody in school actually spoke up and said, no, Columbus did, was a horrible person and they did he did these horrible things and Joey's like yeah that's right you know I know that um like I know the truth so you know we need to start young these kids he, 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 I mean he's saying to me like I can't believe that they're still telling us the you know the misinformation you know the wrong history is what he's saying and it, it's got to feel horrible like I see it in his face like how why are they teaching us lies you know so we need to you know, these kids can't be fed lies and then later on learn on their own the truth. And then what kind of um, respect or trust do they have in the educational system at that point? And that and that's something that also happened with my daughter when she was in high school. They were doing um, a course, you know, Native American history and the teacher actually, she, he, he knew that she was Native American and he actually apologized to her because he, I think he knew what he was saying to her wasn't everything. And, and she, you know, she was shocked. She was like, he, like, he said, sorry to me while he was teaching, I guess, what he, he had to teach. And that's a. Whoops. Kelly, you froze, hon. Oh, wow. um, I I noticed I think it has to change. I, I know if it was like it's one o'clock. Like uh, and so there may be some people going. And I did just see there was a question talking about the backlash. And I think that's going to be huge because all this um, critical race theory stuff is largely the fear of being taught about slavery. But this country was built on the genocide of Native people and the slavery of people of color. And that's a fact that we need to face. And, you know, this whole idea that, you know, white people are too fragile to take the truth um, and the accusation that we're teaching our children white self-loathing is so ridiculous and so defensive. We just need to work through our feelings, cry it out, <laughs> write it out, art it out, music it out. I don't know, whatever you need to do, but acknowledge and face this truth because we're never going to transform until we acknowledge it. And, and it is true that we are probably going to get, um, just as Donna has gotten such incredible, a school district spending $500,000 to keep a racist mascot. I mean, that's some intense motivation. So we are gonna face a lot of backlash, but you know, when it became law, um, it became law. And the backlash happens in every one of these battles. I mean, I myself personally and CNA have been asked to help other community members in other states um, to fight their mascots. And, you know, the, the backlash, the hate, the vitriol, the, you know, the, the uh, disrespect, uh, you know, the telling you that we're doing it for honor, now down and shut up and calling you names. It's all the same. We actually have a bingo card with, you know, it's almost like a script that no matter what community you go into, these are going to be the excuses. This is how they're going to lash out. This is how they're going to behave. You know, it's a total script. So every community that we go into, you know, when people start to behave that way, we're just like, oh, that's normal. You know, so um, if you do join this battle and you start to, um, feel, you know, like you're being attacked, don't feel that you're alone. Just reach out and uh, we can help guide you. 
As educators, I just wanted to add a quick tip about stereotypes, which abound for all races and religions, but also for Native Americans. So we hear at Kidsbridge, all Native Americans are rich because of the casinos. All Native Americans are poor because whatever. So I was lucky enough to vacation on the Navajo reservation and the, and, and the Hogan, you saw that, that small home is where a lot of Navajo people live today. Uh, my niece actually said all Native Americans, you know, are rich because of casinos. And I challenged her as we should challenge all students and even adults. What are the facts? What are their statistics? And I just want to encourage you, students, adults, your children, relatives, get prepare yourself with knowledge for teaching moments. They will come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of those stereotypes are used in the mascot battle because they feel that um, they can throw these things up to you to silence you. Oh, well, you know, when we talk about um, how the land was taken and the, the violence, oh, well, uh, native tribes fought each other too. Well, that has nothing to do with pre present day, modern day, the modern day world. We are, you know, hundreds of years later and it's time to act, you know, to behave properly and to treat each other with respect. And, you know, the things about, you know, us being alcoholics and being rich, those are just ways to silence somebody and say, well, you don't deserve to be treated equally because you are this. And, you know, the thing is, is that it's the same with every culture. Every culture has negative and positive, but you don't use that, those excuses to permit racism towards any other culture. Thank you so much. Um, are there any, we're a little, we're five past one here. So I just wanted to ask, um, you know, before we close out today, if you have any final thoughts, um, again, this has been such a powerful session and thank you, really just thank you so much. Um, but I'll ask for any final thoughts before we, we close out today. Uh, I have a final thoughts for my white brothers and sisters. Um, most of us have lost our connection to our ancestral homes on our ancestral territories. And those of us who are really mixed have this kind of longing for what am I, I'm a Celt, am I a this, what, you know, what's my origin? Instead of taking native culture because you're missing a culture, get in touch with that loss and do whatever research you can to find out what your cultural heritage is, is and celebrate that and be respectful of native culture and don't appropriate it. I have a, a small segment of hope. The Washington Redskins are no longer the Redskins. The Cleveland Indians are the guardians. So that as this, on a societal level, that gives us a lot of hope. Things are changing slowly. So we want you to have hope also for change. Wonderful. Well, this has been, again, a really an amazing and powerful session. Um, and thank you so much for, for being here today. Thank you to our audience. Um, and I hope everyone has a, has a restful remainder of the weekend. And what a wonderful way to close out the, the conference today. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Great. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. Um, take care, everyone.